Therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the City of San Jose apologizes to all Chinese immigrants and their descendants who came to San Jose and were victims of systemic and institutional racism, xenophobia, and discrimination. It was more than 100 years too late, but San Jose, California officially apologized recently for decades of systemic racism against Chinese communities, including an arson attack in 1887 that wiped out a thriving Chinatown neighborhood. More than 1,000 people were displaced, and it was not an isolated incident. Racists often use fire as a weapon against Chinese communities along the West Coast. And this new reckoning comes as Americans, uh, or America's Asian communities grapple with new threats from a rise in hate crimes to concerns about gentrification. Joining me now, Yvonne Kwan. She's a professor of Asian American studies at San Jose University. I'm so, so happy to have you uh, with me this morning and to be talking about something that quite frankly deserves a lot more attention. I'm curious, um, Dr. Kwan, how is it uh, received when a city like San Jose, a hundred years later, issues this apology. I think it's very important in terms of the Chinese American communities here. It's a celebration. It's definitely this reckoning that we're having across the board, but in particular in a quite liberal and progressive place like San Jose, in which we often, you know, conflate more with tech uh, and the booming kind of. Um, different kinds of businesses and growth here, we kind of forget that history. And as my colleague, uh, Connie Young Yu, who's also a descendant of the Second Street Market Chinatown that was burned down due to arson, her grandfather was actually a resident there. What she was saying is that it is a, there were, actual people there, right? Because we we often think about just numbers of, oh, how many people were there? But there were living, thriving communities there. And this is one step to recognize how that, that arson, how that nativism, xenophobia continued to impact the later generations, but also how people pushed back and fought back and fought for this recognition as well. And you said continued, but still continues, quite frankly. And I think this is why, uh, you know, critical race theory is something that's important. There are plenty of conversations. We need to have intellectual curiosity about our fellow countrymen. Um, some people don't always know what the API community has gone through in this country. I remind people this country has not been too kind to any community of color, quite frankly. Um, it, when you don't know a community, it becomes easier to dehumanize that community. I'm curious if you could talk to us about what we don't learn in schools and how that impacts the treatment of some in the API community today. Absolutely. So, for example, someone like me, I am a professor of ethnic studies, right? So one thing that I think folks need to be clear about is that ethnic studies is not just studying about content or people, but really, as you said, grounding it in critical race theory, intersectional critical race and ethnic studies analysis. So we need to revitalize these histories that have been hidden in the history books. And much of K through 12 education, we don't hear about the experiences of of Chinese Americans or other uh, Asian Pacific Islander Americans. And it's really a shame because we can learn so much from this in terms of the contemporary context. As you mentioned about the rise in um, anti-Asian violence, hate crimes, and the such. So usually in our K through 12 classes, we might hear about, oh, the gold rush, the 49ers. Uh, oh yeah, the, the Chinese were there and they helped build the railroads and then move on, right? right. Um, or for example, you learn a little bit about Japanese internment, uh, Japanese incarceration, uh, and uh, also the Vietnam War. But you don't really hear about the individual experiences, the struggles yeah. people uh, encountered through that. Right. And that's it's so important because it ha we have to use those histories to contextualize also relations with other BIPOC, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, right? Because all the folks um, are subjected to similar histories, similar experiences, and instead of dividing people, which is a tactic that is often used in this country, right? Divide and conquer. We, right. I, I would love to see for us to see how these histories are intertwined, how our struggles are intertwined and how we can fight together as co-conspirators and allies to push uh, against racism, xenophobia, and, um, and all of those manifestations in the contemporary context and recognizing how the past continues to yeah. shape the present. 
There's strength in numbers, to your point. Uh, something that I, I noticed living here in, in Washington, D.C., um, a lot of major cities have Chinatowns. And, you know, they're beautiful aesthetically, um, and, you know, they look like, you know, Chinatowns. However, I wonder how many people to this day in the community, in the Chinese community, are benefiting from these Chinatowns as gentrification is also an issue sweeping the country. Yeah, so um, I, I was actually born in Los Angeles Chinatown, uh, and my, for a long time, my, da my dad worked as a waiter there. I had family who had uh, businesses there. I worked in the Los Angeles Chinatowns, and my mother actually worked in a sweatshop um, in Chinatown, but in New York City. So I have had my kind of personal connections with Chinatown, and I have family members still there as well. Um, but because in New York City, rent control, other than that, they would not be able to right. afford to live there, right? But Absolutely. also um, those who are elderly, I think are benefiting from living in places like Chinatown because many do not uh, or may not have had the uh, ability or the exposure to develop the English language. Uh, and, you know, not because of people's unwillingness to do so, but because of migration age, the need to work in these ethnic labor and the right. such. Uh, but... For the elderly folk, because the rent is so low, many of the landlords are not. Yeah, they, right. but they want them out. They're not fixing their, their right. apartments. They're not doing any maintenance on these things. Uh, and right. also a lot of the ethnic businesses are moving out because the rent is so expensive. It's shooting up, exactly. I think that's a displacement that a lot of people don't know about. And Chinatowns are quite frankly safe havens for immigrants and working class communities that are you know, being priced out. I, we're running out of time, so I just want to really quickly um, play a soundbite for you uh, from Senator Chuck Grassley, who made um, you know, an ignorant comment this week, and we'll talk about it on the other side. What you said about your Korean background reminds me a lot of what my daughter-in-law of 45 years has said. And if I learned anything from Korean people, it's a hard work ethic and how you can make a lot out of nothing. So I congratulate you and your people. First of all, that was ridiculous. But secondly, this model minority myth is uh, not a compliment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. And also, uh, it is rooted in anti-blackness. That's the thing. Absolutely. The modern minority myth came out of post-World War II civil rights movement as a way to punish, to discipline uh, black folks, right, who are trying to fight for their rights. They're like, oh, why don't you look at the Japanese Americans? They went through incarceration, and yet look at how successful and wonderful they are, right? So it's this really backhanded compliment that just creates this stereotype in which it invisibilizes and hides the struggles and challenges within Asian American communities. It's not to not recognize the successes and all of that, right? Because we need to do that. We need to celebrate the, the greatness uh, within our communities, but also our communities are immensely complex and diverse. So right, just exactly. touting these exactly. modern minority myths is, is so damaging. It is very damaging, and uh, we also need to disaggregate uh, when we talk about the API community. So we have way too much to talk about, Yvonne Kwan. You'll just have to come back uh, when we have more time. So thank you so much for joining us. And